Welcome to the Todd DeVoe Show, exploring the best ideas and lessons for leaders. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are at in this fine world. And today we're going to be talking about some really important stuff. Matter of fact, uh, some things are happening right now that we're uh, probably going to discuss with earthquakes around the world. Uh, Mexico, I know, has uh, just suffered a couple of them, or at least one with some aftershocks here. We're going to get into that before. I just want to thank the sponsor of the show, the Buffalo Computer Graphics and DLAN. Uh, this organization is outstanding. Uh, they have some really great products. So uh, please check them out. It's the Buffalo Computer Graphics, and they are there for all of your emergency management um, needs. So getting into our topic today, earthquakes, the great shakeout. And I'd like to introduce our guest, the famous Mark Bentley. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for being here again and, and having these discussions each year leading up to ShakeOut. Yeah, I think they're really important. You know, when when we think about the great ShakeOut, the the exercise, the drill itself, you know, and, and I've told the story a thousand times, I'll tell it again. It works. You know, when I had a little 5.8 earthquake, um, my son was like, I think 10 or 11 years old now at the time. Um, and he grabbed my my daughter, who at the time was like a year or two, and um, went under the table, held on. Um, it, was a, it was a little shaker for us. I mean, it was not going to step off the shelf. So, I mean, he did right. And it was just because he learned it in school, the duck cover and hold on. Um, and it still needs to be taught because this morning, um, one of your colleagues uh, has a TikTok channel. And he was showing people in the middle of an earthquake taking out their video camera, standing in the middle of Mexico City or Mexico, uh, videotaping the shaking and and not drop cover and hold on. So that message still needs to get out. As emergency managers, we need to support that. Um, But uh, that's what we're here to talk about. Why why is it important for us as emergency managers to really embrace the great shakeout and and participate? Well, there are many reasons. Shakeout was created in 2008, not only, uh, not really at first, to have people practice self-protective actions during an earthquake. It actually was created to be something that would be big, like a big earthquake, without the shaking and the actual damage and injury, but to with the aspects that would get people talking with each other about earthquake preparedness, what they should do in advance of earthquakes, what they should be doing to secure uh, furniture and other items so they won't fall during earthquakes, what they should have in, of course, in their kits, and uh, and what they should do during all of those conversations that is really what the social science research has shown is what leads people to really taking those actions, having those conversations. So that's where you have drills um, uh, that as we got, as we created that first year as a one-time event, you know, thousands of drills around Southern California um, and based on a earthquake scenario for a large earthquake on the San Andreas fault. And that we, we looked at, okay, we have this scenario. How do we share this with the public in a way that gets people talking and it gets them engaged. And, and uh, there was an earthquake kind of in the, there was a set of activities planned in the fall of 2008, but there was an earthquake in Southern California, the 2008 Chino Hills earthquake. Um, I think it was about a 5.4 yeah. uh, and uh, kind of right in the middle of, 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 it happens to be right kind of in, this, in the area where you're like really close to all the major counties in, in the region. You're kind of Orange County, LA, San Bernardino and Riverside all kind of come together at this point. So, a lot of people felt it, and we had video from TV shows being taped, uh, kind of these uh, judge courtroom type shows, where uh, and others where people ran out, ran outside this probably really a studio and not a courtroom, uh, even though there were things that they could have gotten under protect, to protect themselves. We said we really need to kind of focus in this message. There were other uh, really kind of controversial messages being shared at the time of what you should do. And we said, this is important. And, and, and so it kind of became focused more so around that as the, the fundamental uh, kind of activity of the drill. But really, it's still, you know, it's like a fake quake to uh, to have people 
uh, practicing. And of course, we encourage all sorts of, of practicing of different aspects of emergency plans, not just doing drop cover hold on or lock cover hold on where you're in a wheelchair or other device with the with wheels, so, you know, walk, lock those wheels and not get down on the ground, but instead cover your head, bend over. Uh, so all of these kind of related messaging about how to be safe, what to do when you're driving or if you're in bed or uh, in different places uh, are, are part of it, but also uh, how you're going to, and if you're going to practice an evacuation and a reunification or have a tabletop exercise or, or even a, a, a full scale exercise with people in makeup as if they've been injured and bring brought to a central place for a triage and all, all of that. So, and that happens each year in thousands of locations still um, now you know, uh, around this California, around the country and other countries too. So it starts off in, in California as, as the drill um, and then it has spread. I mean, I've, I talked to some people in New Zealand that participate and Australia that participated. Um, obviously, you know, we've seen the earthquakes in, in Japan and other parts of, of Asia. Um, I'm assuming there's probably people participating there as well. Um, what is like the, the most, it's kind of a weird question, but what is like the most like obscure place that participates in drills that you wouldn't think would, would participate like Newfoundland or something like that? Uh well, we've we've heard and we've seen you know social media posting of of uh, uh, classrooms in England, uh, which really you don't think about with earthquakes uh, and uh, obscure, uh, uh, you know, really across the country in states that are, have few earthquakes. The message that we always say is, even if you don't have earthquakes where you are, you might travel where an earthquake might happen either, you know, for vacation, uh, for school, you might, you know, go to college in, in another place. Uh, you might, of course, for work. Uh, and, you know, we have stories of people who do go to other places and, and where there are earthquakes or tsunamis, famous story from 2004 of a, uh, of a young student who warned people because she had studied and learned that what the signs of a tsunami were. Uh, I think she was from Sweden, I, I believe, on vacation in, I believe, Thailand. Uh, or, and uh, so, so that knowing what to do, even if you're, you know, it's be kind of the equivalent of someone from Southern California having some sense of what to do if they were someday in a in a tornado in the Midwest, right? So. Um, and we all kind of have our kind of maybe our movie influenced ideas for these things uh, and or you know, other pop culture references and TV shows. And what I've been really happy to see, and it, you know, are we having this impact because of the messaging and the repeat and the visuals of the drills? But uh, in more recent movies and TV shows, people are getting down under desks or tables. You know, they're not standing in doorways, which should right. never have been recommended. Uh, it's not safe in a doorway. Uh, you might end up being okay, but you probably uh, would have been okay wherever you were uh, in that situation. If, if the building really did come down and you were in the doorway, it's going to get you. Uh, right. uh, I mean, it's not some magical force field around the door keeping all the all the building components around you. So, getting under something is really what's been recommended by. Our urban search and rescue firefighters who who actually pulled people out of of rubble, um, but mostly it's because the in, injuries that are happening in earthquakes are largely due to falling or flying objects, falling furniture, uh, lamps, uh, other you know collectible items, televisions, all these things that are in our space that, if not secured, can become projectiles in the large um, shaking of an earthquake. Yeah, I remember we had the the Easter earthquake, uh, wow, many years ago now. And uh, was that? Just south of the border in 2010? Yeah, 2010, yeah. And we felt it, I, I was living in Whittier at the time, I felt the way up there and I was in bed taking a nap. And um, the only thing I could do at the time was just take pillows and put it over my head and hope like the, the plate glass window didn't break. You know, and, and just having that, I remember my sister, this is kind of why the, the story's kind of funny. So my sister comes running into the into my, the bedroom and she's like, 
you know, she's from New York, right? And she's like, is this what I think it is? Like, it's an earthquake. I said, just, you know, you know, just get down. You're, you're going to be okay. And um, then there was the following year or close to a year, um, the Washington, D.C. earthquake occurred. And she's in New York. And she's like, ah, I've been through one of these. I know what to do. You know, like, so, so it's just like having that little bit of an experience sometimes um, helps you out. So practicing, like, to go back yeah. to, you know, the fake drills here, the fake earthquake, if you will, uh, really puts that mental mind of that into how to how to react. I think that's that's critical. Um, I do want to ask you a question. So the one of the first earthquakes I ever was involved with, a guy from New York, I was in Japan uh, for the Kobe earthquake. And that was actually the day, same day, a uh, year later, I think, um, of the Northridge earthquake. And then the other day, Mexico had an earthquake again, the same day as the last two large earthquakes, the Mexico City earthquake of was 85, and then the earthquake a couple years ago, same date, and then, and then on the 19th, they had another one with a pretty significant aftershock today, I believe. Um, do earthquakes follow that pattern, like, of a of the day? I mean, is, or is it just a weird thing that occurs? Well, we try to schedule them. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, they're, they are, uh, it's, it's entirely, uh, it, kind of to the day level, we're really talking about pretty random factors here. Uh, there, there, there are reasons why earthquakes happen when they do in terms of the level of strain that's been built up on the faults that they occur on and the movement and, and all that building up. But, um, you know, this, there are some earthquakes that might happen because that strain is so regular and they happen, for example, in central California, uh, not to the day, but to every, there, there, there's a place that for a while is looking like pretty close to every 22 years had a, had a magnitude six or so earthquake called Parkfield. Uh, and so having noticed that scientists put a lot of instruments there ready for it to happen, I believe it would have been in like 1988. And it didn't happen until 2004, I think, so, if I remember right. So uh, that's kind of one level. The day of is 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 uh, odd, but not um, strange. I know Dr. Lucy Jones was talking about it as uh, I guess there's a, a statistics that if you have you can have as few as 23 people together, uh, and it would be a 50 percent chance that there would be. Uh, two or more people with the same birthday among that group. Even though there are 365 days of the year, you only need uh, 23 people to have that. So there's something about that. It's just the way that random uh, occurrences can happen. Um, you know, there have been other big earthquakes in Mexico that haven't been on that day. Um, and, uh, um, you know, they are now doing a big annual earthquake drill uh on that date because mm -hmm. of not all well mainly because of the 1985 earthquake uh but uh, now these others and and it is i can imagine a, a strange thing to do an earthquake drill and then to have an actual earthquake or whichever <laughs> way it happens uh, right. i think it's happened um after the drill uh, yes. the last couple times so uh, and yeah and then of course the the kobe earthquake and northridge earthquake <clears> similar day it's just a random thing uh, at that at that distance, for sure. Absolutely, and a couple of rumors that I, you know, or folk tales, whatever you want to call, you know, people talk about the idea of earthquake weather. Oh, it's earthquake weather, um, and then so your again, your colleague that was on TikTok did a great job of answering that, but I think it was kind of funny because somebody was talking about in the question and answer area or the question area or common area, I should say, talking about um, how how global warming is impacting earthquakes. Um, does weather have anything to do with earthquakes? Generally, no. The, the, once you're, you know, earthquakes happen several kilometers or miles deep within the earth where, where they originate and weather really doesn't affect anything. You know, it's pretty stable once you get down at just a few feet, uh, kind of year round. Uh, you know, there are, uh, many studies that have been done in, uh, on this on weather, on the effects of the tides and in, in the strain of the moon or the sun pulling on the earth. And, you know, that, that make, has some logical uh, uh, sense to it. 
that maybe if an earthquake was kind of soon to happen, that that the tide moving, you know, we think of the tides moving the the water, um, but they do pull the Earth uh, towards the moon when it goes around a little bit. You know, there is a little bit of a of a factor there. So maybe it, it maybe an earthquake happens that was just earlier, or or maybe even it's delayed because of that, um, but not only because of that. Uh, there, you know, you could have uh, a big storm with dr drop a lot of water on an area that that fills up the reservoirs and really puts pressure down. You might have uh, kind of an earthquake kind of related to that, uh, but. But generally, it's not like a certain weather type that just because it's hot or just because, it, you know, it, most of that is our memory of what it was like in some significant earthquake. And it's kind of like that way again. And so we're worried, you know, it's <laughs> it's super hot and dry in January in Southern California. And that's when we people remember how it was during the Northridge earthquake and, you know, and, and so some memory like that. But maybe another place there was super cold and wet <laughs> when the earth <laughs> that's what they, they remember so it, it's um you know generally we all like to see patterns and things we're, right. we're 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 designed our brains are designed to see patterns and things it's, it's helpful to be to be able to distinguish um the patterns uh in our environment you know be able to see the wild beast among the trees that's it's going to come get us uh, and see the pattern. So uh, we often are wanting to make patterns out of earthquakes too or other phenomena, and sometimes it's just not really there. Right. Most the other one I hear, another one I hear a lot, <clears throat> and you know, people even in professionals, right, like those of us that are supposed to know more than others, talk about the idea that in small earthquakes, like those little you know threes and fours and fives. Are, are reducing the strain on, you know, so there won't be a big earthquake. Uh, can you talk about that myth a little bit? Sure. So, you know, a, a uh, 7.0 earthquake is a million times larger than a 3.0 earthquake. It's the way that the logarithmic scale goes and the amount of energy that's released. Um, you go up from a three to a four, that's 32. Well, 32 times 32 times 32 times 32 is is a million, and that's how that works. And so you would have to, in some way, and it's not even quite like this really, but have a million 3.0s right kind of along the fault uh, where that the uh, that 7.0 would otherwise happen, really lined up perfectly in the right time period, and uh, and it just that doesn't happen. We don't have that many earthquakes, and it would. It would take, you know, certainly some thousands of years, thousands of years or so to, to have that many. And they're just uh, not in the right location. And even that is a, a simplification of a lot of the factors that go into having a large earthquake. Now, what uh, one aspect that's kind of to think about that is a large earthquake is just a small earthquake that kept going. Um, you know, it, it gets larger as it ruptures more of the fault. And, uh, and and again, there's many factors involved, but but uh, you know the magnitude of an earthquake is generally related to the surface area that it ruptures, mm. rather the length and the depth of the fault or width of, width of the fault, and so you have to have a bigger fault in, in order to have a bigger earthquake. You can't just put a fault. I mean, an earthquake say that an earthquake is going to happen just anywhere. It has to have a large enough uh, fault for that uh, earthquake to rupture, generate shaking at, on, on, all along the fault. Uh, and the larger the earthquake, it's not going to be like a bullseye where the epicenter was. That's only for small earthquakes. The shaking is going to be coming off of that entire length of the fault. So like the San Andreas shakeout scenario, a 7.8 earthquake uh, is going to rupture for about a... Um, uh, 100 miles or so along the San Andreas, and all along that is going to be generating energy shaking that's going to be coming off. So it's almost like a train coming along the fall. You're going to kind of hear the hear the rumbling, 
in the distance. You're going to start to feel that rumbling, but it's going to be shaking from a distance. So it's not going to be so intense, but it's going to take a while to get to you. And then the, as the earthquake, if it's coming towards you along the fault, the, the shaking, you're going to start to feel uh, shaking closer to the fault. So it's going to be because you're closer, it's going to be stronger, but it's also going to be take less time to get to you. And then eventually it's going to, it might go past you and you might keep feeling shaking coming at you from that fault rupturing further away again. So just like a train kind of gets louder as it comes and goes. Uh, and uh, so the pattern of shaking is not a, any type of bullseye at that point. It's really stretched out over the length of the fault. And, you know, so as you get larger earthquakes, even than that, we don't really think in California, we can have more than a, uh, 8.1 or so along the San Andreas. Uh, even if going from a 7.8 to an 8, that actually has to double the length of the fault, just going up 0.2. Mm. So you're already very large, very long, and then you have to double it to, to get to uh, that larger earthquake. So it, and you'd have to double it again. So the where we have earthquakes that can be that big are along the subduction zones where plates, uh, oceanic plates are diving beneath the continental plates like uh, um, and like with like within Mexico on the Pacific coast of Mexico, Pacific coast of South America, the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, Japan, where cold ocean plates are going down at a low angle on the, beneath the continents. They stay cold. That means they can, they, they stay brittle. They can break deeper into the earth's crust. So you can have maybe a thousand kilometers uh, along, uh, along the ground, but it could go maybe 400 kilometers deep. And all of that then can break and that you can get a much bigger uh, surface area. In California, fortunately, our, you go about 20, 30 kilometers down, you get to the ductile zone, as it were. It, it's, it doesn't break. And so our earthquakes can only get lo larger, the magnitude, if you get longer along the fault. You have to get a very, and, and that's why San Andreas is the, the longest fault. Uh, other faults like the San Jacinto Fault is, uh, uh, and Garlic Fault and, uh, and others are long the, in, the, in the Bay Area. There's the Haywire, uh, sorry, Hayward Fault, for which there has been a, a scenario called the Haywired scenario, uh, studying that, uh, what will happen in that and how it will disrupt our connections of, in many types. So you have, uh, that's the fortunate news is that most of our faults in, in uh, California are much smaller than the San Andreas and therefore can't have as big of earthquakes. So when we're planning for, for earthquakes as on that side of it, right? And we, <clears throat> I always say plan for the biggest one you could possibly think about because then the small ones it'll work easier. Um, but some of the things that we, we really need to consider, like even that 5.8, the Chino Hills earthquake, Knocked out communications um, in Long Beach, Los Alamitos, with with uh, with your um, Seal Beach, uh, parts of Garden Grove, um, you know, uh, uh, Palma, Cerritos. Everywhere. Well, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll add that not only knocked may have knocked out some communications, but because so many people were calling each other, and it it, it overwhelmed the the network. And yeah. that's why we have to not do that after an earthquake, but instead maybe text a quick text. And then if someone's okay, don't start having those conversations like, oh, I wasn't for you. Or, you know, really leave the lines for the emergency um, responders to use. Yeah. And it, well, what it did is it shut down the central office because there's so many people were on the phone. The central office, the CO for the, for AT, for AT t Verizon closed. Right. Yeah. And so we lost 911. So my point about that, it happened at noon. The earthquake happened yeah. well around lunchtime, right around noon. So more people were awake out and doing things. Um, and, and so, Kevin, in back 2008, to by the way, too. How many yeah. people? More people now are are living on their phones than in 2008. This was before iPhone. It was just before the iPhone. Just before, you're right. Yeah. You know, so I, I, we have to. It's it, we're so reliant on checking that and being on it, and all of that data and all that. It, you know, our our, cell, our telephone system is only set up to accommodate something like 20% of phone pe uh, people with phones being able to make a call at the same time on a given day because we, we're not always making calls, fortunately. But in these moments when people do, 
yeah, it just it, uh, shuts it all down. Yeah, so making sure that you have a, a backup communications plan, you know, uh, yes. I think it's, it's critical. Um, and then I know that Dr. Jones wrote in her book, uh, the big one, that if, if that large scenario that we're talking about goes off, that we might be without water and other infrastructure uh, for months. Um, and so I, I think that's the other side of it, that we why we need to stress be participating in the great shakeout and using this as a really great way for us as emergency managers to share this with the community, whether it's, you know, or, or if you're in a business uh, with the people who you work with, because this is really going to have a, a major impact on how things will go forward with, especially here in Southern California. Um, <clears throat> you know, you can find different scenarios and different products um, on the Great Shakeout a website. Um, how do you guys come up with those different uh, products and stuff to help out? So ShakeOut was created based on the USGS uh, ShakeOut scenario, but we, we brought together a group I created in 2003 called the Earthquake Country Alliance as a public, private, grassroots, community leader uh, association of people who have worked together to create a lot of the materials that we provide and a lot of the guidance. So uh, broad consensus uh, across uh, emergency management and researchers and the public and you know how do how do we understand this and uh, and, and uh, of course engineers and scientists and so at earthquakecountry.org you'll find the seven steps to earthquake safety which provide a, a really step by step um, uh, approach to what to do to be safe before during and after we like to say so you're prepared to survive and recover and we have versions of that material in uh, as uh, uh, in, in, in each uh, in different formats and it and each step has extensive information for example how to secure all sorts of different things how to be safe in all sorts of different situations what to have in your kit uh, how to minimize your financial hardship uh, and what to do afterwards to to uh, you know, when it's still a danger period, how to improve safety, and then how to recover in the long time. So a lot of our guidance and videos and and, uh, and other messaging are related to that. We have translated a lot of our resources, and uh, now we have uh, something like thirteen documents in fifteen languages. Top language is uh, spoken in California uh, at earthquakecountry.org/languages, and uh, we have a whole. Uh, separate website at terremotos.org in Spanish with all of that too. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, <clears throat> and I would say, and we encourage people to join the Earthquake Country Alliance. Yes. Go to earthquakecountry.org slash join. Uh, you'll you'll get our uh, emails about our webinars and, and workshops about our committees, such as the Higher Education Committee that you're a part of, Todd, given your background. Um, and others that people can participate in and be a part of helping to make these documents. So we really welcome everybody to join. It's free. And it's just really about uh, working together to uh, you know, make a difference in our future earthquake safety. If a group could only do one thing on the Great Shakeout Day, what would you tell them to do? Well, if, if you only do one thing, it's certainly it's practicing what you would do to, to be safe during an earthquake. So Having people practice drop, cover, hold on where they are, or lock, cover, hold on the equivalent if someone's in a wheelchair or walker, uh, their device with wheels, uh, or you know where if you're out driving, you follow those instructions. And so at earthquakecountry.org/step five, we have all of that, all of what to do during an earthquake and on shakeout. It's really described as well. But yeah, you you go to shakeout.org before shakeout day. You register that you're going to be doing a drill. So letting us know how many people. That's how we know that already we have 8.2 million people planning to participate this year in the California shakeout and uh, more than 14 million or so nationwide right now. All of this is growing and will, uh, will uh, be much larger by shakeout day. But registering is important. You'll get our emails and information. You'll be able to um, uh, be a part of the this you know huge earthquake drill and and be an example to others as we uh, with your permission we will list your organization as participating on the website 
and it does seem to inspire other people to uh, seeing how all the participants to also join. I've seen some really cool ways of getting people to participate um, at schools um, in the Great Shakeout, whether they do selfie contests, uh, give uh, tchotchkes and candy bars and things like this away uh, for participating. So there's so many kind of unique and interesting ways that you can get your organization to participate. And this year, the Great Shakeout Day is? October 20th. And while it's not required, most people uh, will participate at 1020 a.m. So 1020 a.m. on 1020 in 2022. Uh, we kind of have that at that time based on the date each year. But you can have your drill at any time of that day, and you can have your drill any day of the year. Uh, it's not such a requirement, but and this is in your local time zone. So it's uh, it really is kind of like a reverse wave around the planet. Uh, people getting down rather than up uh, starts in Guam and uh, and goes around you know you know ends in Hawaii or American Samoa. Uh, so it it. Uh, uh, most time zones have will have people participating. You know, it's kind of cool too is they have the the audio that you can borrow, um, download, and play. And uh, I would play that on the um, when we did our mass notification. That would be our message. It would come out and it would have like the sounds of the shaking and things. Um, and it, it goes on for for a little bit. And I think that's a really neat uh, product that you guys have produced. Um, uh, for it has a, a, some sh shaking sounds and also a narration of and you know, it says, Okay, here, we're about to do the drill, here's what you do drop it down to the ground, and kind of walks people through that. And importantly, also tells them that it's over and yeah. they can get it. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you so for spending some time with us this morning. Don't forget, next month, um, on the 11th of, of uh, October, Mark and I are going to do a webinar uh, based upon this with a little bit more detail. A little bit more time. It's a question and answer. So hopefully you can join us um, on the 11th. Look for your social media for more details on that. And Mark, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Todd. Hey, everybody. Thank you for spending time with me this morning. And the great shakeout and, and earthquake drills are critical for safety and critical for getting people really in that mindset to understand what is happening. And I really do hope that you participate. Go to the great shakeout uh, website. Register your organization and participate and use, re, really use the resources that are there. So until next time, everybody, please stay safe and stay hydrated.